Okay, hello everybody, thank you for coming and welcome to my talk about proactive bug finding and taking advantage of the Debian infrastructure to find new bugs. A quick summary, I will uh, first talk about finding bugs in the sources without uh, trying the software or having a look at the compiled side of the, the software. I will um, then uh, present a few tools to find bugs in binary packages and eventually finding bugs at runtime from the binaries we just built from the package. So first, bugs in the sources. Um, you have several ways to find bugs in the sources. First, you can do full audits of the source code which is quite expensive, requires time, skills, and sometimes very expensive tools. So it's really only worth it if you have a lot of time and if you're auditing very critical components of, of your system. There is a Debian security audit project, which I don't know very well, but it exists. And what it does is certainly useful, but you have way, ways to help as well, finding bugs, in faster ways, uh, spending less energy on, on finding these bugs, doing cheaper, faster, and more automated checks for, for bugs. So it's really not perfect. We still need these security audits, which, which go far beyond what can be done with, with automatic tools. But grabbing the code is really cheap, and you can find many, many things like that. So here's an example of a common bug that only started appearing when people stopped using only the i386 architecture. So this function takes a, a pointer to a buffer of, of chars and writes an integer in the first bytes of this, uh, of this buffer. So what it does is create a temporary pointer to an int and writes the integer to into the first uh, uh, into the first address of of this new pointer. So this usually works on on a standard PC. It works because even if the address is not aligned, you have traps to to detect that it's not aligned, and it often works quite well. But it may crash at random on other architectures that do not support unaligned reads and writes. And when you build this code, GCC emits a warning saying, oh, you have two different pointers. You cannot do uh, TMP equals buffer here. So this is a bug you can find just by looking at the, at the build logs and the GCC warnings. You may want to fix the warning by doing this. Just saying, oh, okay, buffer is not the right type. I just say it's a, a pointer to an integer instead. So GCC stops complaining, and you don't see the warning. But it's exactly the same code, and you have exactly the same bug. But this time, you cannot detect it from the GCC warnings. However, you have a chance to find this by grouping the code for um, for int or unsigned int uh, star, which is, well, it's not always a bug to, to cast something into a pointer in to an integer, but it's, it's the kind of stuff you want to check in your code. You can also fix it this way by using memcopy, which cares of the unalignment issues because it copies byte by byte. There's a new problem here, which is using four as the size of the data you're copying because an integer doesn't always have four bytes. It depends your your platform. So it's not really slower because GCC will inline the, the memcopy call, but on certain architecture it might only write half the integer. Uh, well, the list of architecture I gave is, I think, wrong because int is always 32 bytes. 
on these architectures, but <laughs> just assume I, I put long int into instead of int here, and <laughs> it's it's still good. So this cannot be automatically automatically found because you cannot just grab for the number four. Well, in fact, grabbing for the number four in some specific parts of your code or or very old code that used to work only on on DOS or Windows can find some of these of these bugs just looking for the number four. So the one of the correct ways to do it is to use size off because you you know that size off uses the right size for for the integer and copies the right amount of bytes. Uh, you should use uh, the std int header if you are if you need to to deal with integers of specific sizes if you need an integer that's specifically 32 bits you should use int 32 t which is a new c99 type but which you can use in c89 as well using this header so this can be useful to port the applications, but let's go back at finding the bugs in the first place. So auditing in an automatic way means auditing the whole source code of the, the whole archive. So you, if you want to do s some something like this, you need to get a very big hard drive because unpacking the, the whole archive, the whole Debian archive is very, very big. It's more than, than 100 gigabytes. You, you need to, to make sure also that you unpack all exactly everything that's in the archive. Sometimes you have a tarball in a tarball, and then again a, a tarball in this. So you may miss some files if you just depackage and unpack your, your files. And then grab through the code, that's all. So be careful the file names you're grabbing for because a C++ file is not always uh, a .cpp file. They have a lot of different names and upstream likes to, to well, think of very original names for, for their files. Or you can just grab for everything because you may find, I don't know, automatically automatically generated code in the upstream table or self-generating stuff that uses, I don't know, shell scripts to generate C or stuff like that. You you can't imagine what, what you can find. <laughs> um, well, this is going to output a lot of craft if you grab for, for specific C or C++ uh, chunks of code, so you need to, I don't know, um, maybe go through the first 100 packages and see all the, the false positives you may have and find ways to to grab dash V, these false positives. And so it's not, it's not a, a magical solution to, to find bugs, but a few regex can, y can really get you to very um, suspicious, suspicious code that really needs to be either rewritten or, or fixed when it's really a bug. There's also this nice tool which is Google Code Search, which uses regexes, so you don't have to unpack the whole archive, it's already on the Google servers. It's very, very fast. You can use very complex regexes with it and it it goes through the whole Google code search archive. I don't know how many packages they have, uh, where they get exactly their software. They don't, they don't have all that Debian has, but they have more stuff that's not in Debian, like Windows software and so on. So it's a good complement to it because you can find weird structures in, in some code that's not in Debian and then look for it in the Debian archive using different regexes and so on. However, it doesn't do multi-line search, so you you cannot look for for C statements split on two lines. That's a very uh, 
very nasty limitation. I hope they will find ways to 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 work around around this. But it's still a very useful tool. So that's an example of a Google code search query. I simply search for in star for cast into an in star followed by something saying char. So what you see are probably not bugs, uh, but they are very, very uh, nasty pieces of code. Basically, they are casting a pointer into a car star and then adding some offset and then saying the resulting pointer is a pointer to an integer. So they might have the offsets right, but you're never sure. And you can be sure that by running through the 8,000 uh, results of this query, you are going to, to find very nasty bugs. So we do have tools in Debian to do more clever uh, static analysis. We have RATS, which does a lot of different languages, C, C++, PHP, Perl, and Python. It's not very clever in the sense that it understands what different functions do to each other, other and so on, but it still can find very interesting bugs. We have pscan, which does only C and a bit of C++ and focuses on on uh, format string vulnerabilities and general bugs. We also have specialized tools for different languages, Jlin for Java and PyChecker for Python. And while there are many, many more that are not in Debian that you may want to try and maybe package for Debian if you find them useful. So just Google for static code analysis to find more software like this. I'm going to talk about compiler warnings now because the first bug I showed issued a compiler warning when the when GCC noticed that the two pointers were not the same type. So what do compiler warning tells? They don't say there is a bug in your software. They don't say your code is illegal. Though most of the time it's really illegal, but GCC just says, okay, that you meant to do this. I am going to assume that it was all right to to write what you s what you did. I'm going to assume you meant this. And sometimes, what GCC assumes is not what you wanted to do with your code. So usually, there are ambiguities in your code, and GCC says, "Okay, this is my default way to handle your ambiguity, but please try to clarify it and disambiguate your code." If there, if there are warnings, they're here for a reason, and you should understand what the warnings mean before trying to fix them. That's the second example I gave. Just adding int star to your code doesn't make the bug disappear. It only makes the warning disappear. That's not what you want to do. Also, you are in a privileged situation where you have access to a to our whole build infrastructure with many, many different architectures with different endianness, different pointer sizes. Uh, we're going to have different kernels to, to try them and so on. You can already have a look at the, at the herd uh, build logs which have different system headers and can make your, your build different. You can have access to the K3BSD build logs already. And all of this, your upstream is probably not aware of it and probably probably doesn't care. But we as Debian do care about other architectures. So we need to have a look at our build logs. Some porters are already doing this. They are grabbing the, the build logs for common errors and common uh, portability issues, but you as the maintainer might want to have a look at them as well. So um, how do you activate compiler warnings? GCC doesn't always emit warnings for everything. Usually it emits warning for very dangerous stuff by default, 
Then you have different other flags like uh, dash w all that emits warnings for, for very common errors in your code. Well, errors or ambiguities, like I said. There's also dash w that emits a few additional warnings that may annoy you if you're dealing with very old code or very, I don't know, very special code constructs that are perfectly valid but that emit warnings for some or some reasons. You have also a lot of other additional useful ones that you cannot activate with a magical flag that would activate all warnings. But for instance, tests between signed and unsigned integers, usually you don't mind that if you compare i and j, and i is an int and j is an unsigned int, there's, us there's usually no problem. But if you if your integers reach very high values and or very negative values and reach the boundaries of what your system has for integer values, then you might run into trouble. And so it's it's always good to have a look at these warnings. So the way to catch these warnings in is not well, the way, the way to fix these warnings is not always to cast the int into an unsigned int, but it might be to make sure that max int isn't reached by your integer. Um, well, just don't blindly cast things into another in C and believe that if the warning disappears, your problem disappears as well. And the problem is that upstream doesn't always the, um, always activate the warnings. You have very weird build systems that do not allow you to change C flags and sometimes it's just a matter of adding a flag. And I'm going to show a few ways to activate warnings when compiling your software. So for AutoTools packages, it's really easy. You just export C flags when doing the, the configure step. That's what you do in Debian rules, and usually it works perfectly. Sometimes upstream didn't use the, the auto tools the way they were supposed to be used. And given how complicated they might be, it's not always upstream's fault. But sometimes you have to export uh, C flags or another another variable like AMC flags or very weird stuff just to get the compiler warnings to be to be activated. If your package doesn't use them, you might have to edit the make file or whatever build system it's using. It's sometimes very, very difficult to add a specific compiler flag to your application. You may need to edit by hand all the make files of your project. And sometimes also, and this is what libtool does, um, or automake, well, a combination of the two, the output of the compiler is sent to dev null. This is, for instance, because uh, when you build a library with libtool, you build both a shared and a static library. And the libtool developers assume that if the static version of the library compile OK, then the shared version of the library will compile the same way. So there is no need to output the warnings in the, um, in the static version of the library. But sometimes uh, this compilation step is slightly different. There are um, sometimes assembly constructs that, that change depending on the architecture. For instance, on ETH, on i386, you have one register that is always used for a specific purpose in libraries. And so this register is not available. And if you are using assembly code in your, in your program, then this might fail at the compilation step. And GCC doesn't say anything and just exits or sometimes it doesn't exit and you don't know what happened to your build, there's a missing file and so on. So redirecting the compiler output to dev null is not usually a good idea. 
Uh, I wrote a small library to override this, which simply wraps every call to execve or exec VP and anything that make or GCC or those build application does and checks what flags are given to GCC and adds, adds the missing flags. If you want, I don't know, dash W to be added, it adds them. It can remove flags and detects when the, the output of your program is redirected to dev null, which you do not want usually. So here is an example of what it does. It's an excerpt of a build log. So you can see at line six, there's a make wrap warning saying, oh, this version of GCC was called with only dash W all. I'm adding dash W and dash W sign compare. And you can see at the end of the screen, there's a lot of, of warnings about uh, signed and unsigned comparisons between, between integers. So it's just an example of what it does, and you you need just need to export LD preload before calling the package build package, and it will do everything for you. And well, your build will have more warnings. Sometimes they're really useless, and you don't want them. But you may run into new bugs by by using this technique. So this is an auto tools using program. So there was no no real interest in doing this, but. If your package uses a null make file or scons or things you don't necessarily understand, then it's a very easy way to, to change compiler flags. I'm going to talk about other compiler warnings now. You have one very, very dangerous warning that you should almost always fix, which is implicit declaration of function whatever. This is problematic because when you do not declare a function prototype without before using it, GCC will make a lot of assumptions about what this function does. For instance, it will assume that the function returns an int. And if your function actually returns a pointer, then on, on a PC machine, on an i386 architecture, everything will be all right because an int and a pointer have the same size. So, well, the type is different, but the contents of the register at, at return time are the same. So, no bug here. But if you do the same on AMD64, then your program will crash because the, the called function will return a pointer on 64 bits and the calling function will just read the first 32 bits of that return value because it thought it was an integer. So you end up having a lot and lot of bugs with, with functions returning, in, uh, with returning pointers on 64 bits architectures. There's also a problem with your arguments because the compiler will assume that the type of the arguments you give to your function are the types that are expected by the uh, by the by the function, and this is not always the case. You may expect the the compiler to cast a long int into an int, or any any kind of implicit cast at call time, but this is not always the case, and the compiler cannot guess whether it was a long int or an int that was expected. So on, on a PC, again, there will be no problem because int and long int have the same size. But again, on a 64 bits architecture, you will call your, your function with the wrong arguments. And well, you're probably going to crash. Another common warning is um, suggest parentheses around assignment used as truth value. This is usually either when you forget the double equal in an if test or when you meant it but didn't add an additional pair of parentheses. So it's not really a bug because it's probably exactly what you wanted to do and the C standard doesn't say anything about doing if x equal five. But if you start ignoring this warning and one time just 
forget to do the double equal where you meant double equal, well, then you have a bug. So this is the kind of warning that are worth fixing because when they really appear, you will you will notice them and just not say, okay, I just I just didn't want to put the double parenthesis and I don't care. Another warning is a uh, warning about uninitialized variables, which you only can get when turning on the optimization flags when you build, so remember that. The optimizer will run many checks on when and until when variables are used, initialized, and when they can they can use an additional register to replace this variable that's no longer used and so on. So the optimizer is doing very clever stuff to to deal with your variables and it can detect when you're using a variable that you have not assigned before. So do not assume that variables that you declare on the stack are zeroed or have a default value or anything because they do not. So always initialize your variables if you need them and very usually this is this is a bug and needs to be fixed at the code level so why use the build d logs because they are all in one place you can download them you can grab for them in a very quick uh, way um, I was told it was one gigabyte of data approximately for one architecture so, well, it's a lot of data, but you can do a lot and a lot of tests on them. And, well, what's very good as well is that they have all the architectures, and as I said, architectures vary a little bit, and this little bit is very frequently what causes the bugs to appear. So, it's very good to have them available. One problem is that when you upload a package, the build these do not get well the build d.debian.org site does not get your build log so actually we have all the arch architectures except yours and yours might have been important as well so it would be nice to have these build logs as well on the same site just to to make things consistent now i'm going to talk about bugs in the binary packages um, a few tools we already have in Debian to check for, for bugs and check packages, which you hopefully all know already. The first of these is Lintian. So Lintian checks source and binary packages, and well, most of the tests it does, it does is about the policy, so it checks whether packages comply with the policy and it outputs a machine readable output which can be then used for data mining and getting a list of packages which are which have the following warning issued by Linton and so on and we have a service on linton.debian.org that outputs everything Linton says about about the current archive you can add your own checks to Linton it's not very difficult. Uh, what you just need to understand what Linton does. When you give it a package, it extracts it in, in what it calls a laboratory and gathers information about what is in the package. For instance, uh, whether a given file is a script. If it's an executable, it runs opjump on it and gathers information about symbols, uh, all the all the usual stuff it then needs to to check to see whether a package is compliant or not and well then it runs the checks so to create a check you need to know a bit of Perl because Lintian checks are Perl scripts that implement one single function which is run and it uses all kind of information from the Linton um, from the Linton laboratory and Lintian exports a few functions that you can use to ease the task and you can easily write a check that runs on all scripts that are in the Linton um, uh, meta information and well check whether, I don't know, you can check for specific functions that you do not want to call in a shell script 
there's a check for bashisms in, in shell scripts that you can use to do your own check. I, I really don't know what you could be looking for, but but it's very easy to write a check for this. And then you can run Linton on the whole archive and you will have your own check um, applied to all the package. You should also create a description for the text that you want to add to Linton. So I uh, have a few ideas about improving linton.debian.org that I discussed a bit but did not really uh, really discuss with the linton.debian.org maintainer and it's not it's in a too early stage of, of completeness to really be useful but what I would like to know is for instance uh, there's a warning in my package in which version did it appear so what caused it, what caused the the warning to appear was it a new upstream version? Was it something I changed in the compiler flags? Was it something uh, that I changed by changing the relationship with another library or something like that? I would like to know as well which other packages have had this tag appear at which time. Maybe it was just a new Linton version that added the tag. And then why, what did the other package maintainers do to fix this tag? So for a given tag, I, I will get the information on how to fix it, uh, the practical information, because sometimes just the, the tag des descriptions doesn't tell me what to do to fix the, the tag. And then you can then use it to fix other packages and help the people who have this, this tag at one time. So one idea would be to use mole for, for gathering the information, because uh, well, it, it's already a multiple purpose data mining um, framework for everything we have in the archive and, and around it. I have a proof of concept code that doesn't appear because the screen is too small, but I have a screenshot at least. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's readable. Well, that's the usual Linton output that you get from a given package, but this one shows different versions of a package, and in red you see tags that have appeared in a given upload, and in green you see tags that disappear in the next upload of this package. For instance, the first tag, package uses deprecated dev helper compat version 3, was, uh, well, it disappeared in the next upload. So, well, this is an easy tag and you should know how to fix it, but uh, if you have a more complicated tag, you may know that it was in the, the upload 2.1.4a-5 that the, the tag was fixed. So this is a variable service that I think we should have because I have Linton warnings that I am unable to fix because they require very very difficult modifications in the code about um, s a self-modifying stack in the libraries and stuff like that. So it requires time and, and if I can get my hands on a, on a package that fixed this morning, then I would get more information about how to fix it. So there is another tool, very much like Linton, which is called Linda. It really does the, the same thing as Linton, except it has different checks. It's written in another language. And, well, you really should use both, just in case, because I don't think one or the other is superior to, to the other, so just use both. And if you want to implement a test and you use you're more familiar with Python than with Perl, well, just add your check to Linda because it does exactly the same thing. It has Python checks. Um, well, metadata about long descriptions of the tags and what they do, but really they are similar in how they are implemented, except Linda is more object-oriented, but 
you should really be able to write your own checks if you are familiar with Perl or Python. So why would you want to create new checks? Because uh, QA is not always about the policy. You want to have different checks for, for packages. You want to initiate the transition and you want to know how many packages are affected by this transition, well, you can just add a tag to Linton and run Linton, and, and well, it's easier than downloading the archive and writing your, your own script to check them usually, because Linton does all the unpacking for you. It's not always that easy, but, but using the existing tools to check this is a gain of time. So a few examples, you, can, you could check for packages which have a menu, um, a menu file but no desktop file, and yet they are desktop ap applications, so you might want to create one. Packages that have a menu file but no icons. Uh, you may want to check for packages lacking a, an XVCS version control uh, information field in the control file, because you know this package is is managed by a revision control system and it would be nice to have this information in the package. You can check whether a package ignores or just handles the deb build options flags in a weird way or just, just ignore them. Or what I did was extract font copyright information from all the fonts that we have in Debian to check whether a few a few fonts were duplicates or non-free or something. So adding checks to these tools is, is very easy and you should consider it when you have something to do on the whole archive. There's a recent tool called PewParts that you may want to, to check as well. Um, I know I discovered it pretty late so you might maybe not know about it. Well, some of you. <laughs> uh, what it does is install a very, a very minimal system with almost no dependencies and tries to install your package, installing all the dependencies and pre-dependencies, checks whether it removes properly, purges properly. You can check for upgrades. You can check, check for mass upgrades, like an, an edge to Lenny, upgrade, you can check for stuff like that. And you really should use it because um, more than once you see packages that that have very grave bugs that you can find with pew parts and they are in the archive anyway because many of us do not test their packages because they just did a minimal um, change to it and didn't think it was worth testing it but Sometimes it is, so try to use these tools. Okay, pew parts can be extended as well. I must admit I do not know how, uh, but I have a few ideas of what could be done to pew parts to make it even more useful for some packages. For instance, you could corrupt files in var cache, which are not supposed to be well corrupted, but sometimes the information you get in these files can come from corrupted websites. For instance, if your apt cache is broken, you may try to see what happens if you try to install packages and so on. Um, you can mass check package installations with bin.sh set to bash or zsh or other, other shells that claim or are remotely compatible with the POSIX standard. Well, they're not necessarily bugs, but if it's a one-liner to fix your package so that it works with bin.sh set to zsh, well, you, you really want to fix this. Okay, last I'm going to talk about runtime bugs, bugs that you can find once the application is compiled and you can run it. Sometimes your software has a test suite in it. You can run make check or make test or whatever after having compiled the application. 
it's usually not activated by default, so you have to run it by hand or add it to Debian rules or something like that. If it can be activated at build time, well, please do it if it's not too much um, too much load for the auto builders. Maybe disable it for M68K or any slow architecture, but if you're building your application for AMD64, try the test suite. Maybe don't make the build fail if the test suite fail, but just to get the information of whether it works at all. And um, well, if you're tired of building your own package times and times, and you you want to disable the check, you might want to implement the dead build options equal no check flag that was proposed in a recent bug. So you just export this variable and your 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 package will build without doing the test. Try also to remain cross buildable. Uh, check that the target architectures uh, the target architecture matches the the current architecture so so that you can really run the the binaries that you built because they do not necessarily build on your architecture when you're building a package. And well, if there is no test suite, you may want to create one yourself. Um, I agree, it's not really your job as a package maintainer, but sometimes you, you see weird interactions between one package and one other package. Um, well, you might want to write a test for this. Maybe, well, it's just when one library is installed, it has weird effects to, to your software, or, or it used to have. You can check for regressions with a few lines of additional makefile code. So think of it if you think it might be useful. One other common practice when you do not have a test suite is to use fuzzing. The idea of fuzzing is to use known data or random data and alter it and feed it to your software. This has this is very uh, trendy these times because people are tired to check for bugs by reading source code and they're using fuzzing more and more to to easily find bugs because it's really the the lazy programmer solution, but it, it works. It exposes bugs in a lot, a lot of, of user applications which get their data from the web or from emails and every crash that's caused by an application reading an email or reading something from the web is a potential vulnerability and a potential attack vector. So these bugs should really not be underestimated. I wrote a small fuzzing application that I will show you. It's really simple. Simple. It's called Zuff, and it uses LD preload to fuzz data. So you just run your application with the usual flags into Zuff, and it will corrupt depending on what exactly you want to corrupt. Um, you can choose which files are co corrupted, whether you want to to corrupt network input or a DVD, and then it checks what happens when you run the application. Uh, it, it checks for crashes, segfaults, aborts, and so on. It checks whether your application stra starts eating all the memory, whether it entered an, an infinite loop and doesn't exit, and so on. And the behavior is reproducible. So you can tell Zuff, well, try a billion random seeds and you go to sleep and the following morning you get a report from Zuff saying, well, the following seed caused, it caused the application to crash, this one caused it to run forever and so on. And you can reproduce the bug. You can generate a file that when fed to the application without using Zuff will crash the application the same way or almost the same way. Sometimes it doesn't work for complicated reasons, but it's really easy to use and, and you find bugs very, very quickly. So this is an example of Zuff running on the CAT program. 
it just cats a file and you see there is one corrupted uh, byte shown by the green arrow. This is by fuzzing 0.1% uh, uh, of the, the output bytes, of the input bytes, sorry. So what Zuff does is run the program cat and intercepts open, fopen, and all those functions, and then read, write, and so on. And when it, it, when it intercepts read, it will corrupt what the read function writes into the buffer. So this is the same call with 3.8 of the bits corrupted. So you see the, the output is a lot different and becomes almost unrecognizable. So you can fine tune the, the randomness, uh, not the randomness, the fuzziness factor to, to check how your application behaves when, when fed with this kind of data. It has a debug mode that's that tells you what files your application opens and when it reads data and so on. So this is an example on the file program. You see that the file program opens etc magic and one file in user share before opening it's the argument you gave it you gave to it. So you do not want to fuzz what's in etc magic or in user share because it's supposed to be trusted data. You can check for bugs as well, but they are not security bugs because uh, what's in ETC magic isn't supposed to be changed by an attacker. Or if the attacker can change ETC magic, it's not going to to trick you into running fine. It will do more nasty things. So you need to tell Zuff to ignore what's in ETC, for instance, and have it only open bin ls, which is the file I gave it as an argument. So that's how you do it. Dash E and you ignore um, it's, uh, they are regular expressions, so you can ignore dot PNG files if you, do if you only want to fuzz JPEG files or stuff like that. And you see the result with virus random seeds from zero to five. And you see that sometimes uh, file sees a real elf binary. Sometimes it only sees data, random data. And well, it doesn't crash in this example, but you can get file to crash with, uh, spe well, you could uh, cause file to crash with uh, specially crafted files. So even if it crashes, you need to do something afterwards. This is an example of give to pnm. Uh, what the argument says are try random seeds from zero to one thousand and change the the fuzzing r amount between zero dot one percent and ten percent, and just try give to pnm image dot gif. Uh, 1,000 times, and it exits after 19 tries and says, well, at try 19, there was a segmentation fault, and that's the, well, it, it just exits ha after having found a segmentation fault. So then you can use Zuff to create a new file with the exact same parameters, which is seed 19 and the random factors which are the same and save it to a new GIF file and then it causes gif to pnm to crash immediately. So you do not need to, to have Zuff to debug the, this problem afterwards. This is another example with entire word. I think that entire word is activated by default when you install it and have MUT. So if you receive a a dot doc document in an email. I think anti world anti world tries to to open it and display it in text mode. So be careful. Um, there are many many ways to crash anti world. It seems. I don't know whether any of these are security issues, but be careful. You see a lot of segmentation faults, uh, heap corruptions, and memory exhaustion. So. I wouldn't trust the entire world at, at this time. There's a lot of 
additional fuzzing software available. There's one very interesting one called Ashwar, which is more of a framework than of a real application, but it has many connected applications and it's very, very clever. It has a lot of file parsers for different file formats. It can, it, if it has knowledge of the file format, it can try different values in a given part of the file format. For instance, if your, your file format uses checksums like the PNG format, then a tool like Zerf is useless because you change one bit and the checksum is wrong and there's really no chance that by corrupting the, the checksum as well, you will get the, the proper file. So for some complicated formats, you need a tool that is format aware and Hashua is one of these. There are many other fuzzing application and more and more are appearing nowadays. You have specific SQL injection fuzzers for web applications, you have LDAP fuzzers, you have IP stack fuzzers and so on. So just look for fuzzing, fuzz testing or fault injection on Google and you will find all the tools you might need to, to check your applications. So now fuzzing as a test suite, why do this? Well, I already explained it a bit. It's a very cheap way to have a test suite. You can just build depend on the fuzzer and add, add a one-liner to Debian rules and check your application after it has built. This way you can benefit from all the architectures we have because we already saw that all applications do not behave the same way on all architectures. So it's really a benefit to to have this build architecture. Um, please be reasonable. Do not run a test suite that runs for 24 hours on 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 AMD 64 because uh, a few build maintainers will hate you. And also, think before making the test suite cause the build to crash, well, to fail because. Uh, it's a random build failure and it's probably not policy compliant. So, and maybe it's a very isolated bug that's not really as critical. So, you shouldn't be making a build fail just because one of the checks in the test suit failed. But it's up to you. I don't know what kind of software you package, and it might be wise to to cause the build to fail just in case, but really think of it and know what the checks are about without making before making the, the build fail. You can also have test suits for GUI applications, even of uh, in a in a build daemon. You just need to install the XVFB package, which is an X server for the virtual frame buffer um, feature of the kernel and it just launches a Nix server in memory and displays its contents in memory and it doesn't need a screen to work. It just needs the the minimal amount of, of software that you need to, to install to get your application running. So you may want to try uh, to, to have test suits for GUI applications as well. It's complicated, you need to make sure that your application has a way to exit after a time, otherwise your build will just hang. But it's a thing work it's a thing worth having in mind. So I'm finished. If you have any questions I will take them. I don't know how much time remains is remaining, but I don't think we have more than five or ten minutes. Not yet, no, uh, none of them. <laughs> um, as a, maybe for people who are interested in Lintian, there's tomorrow a buff about Lintian, so people who want to know more about writing checks uh, can attend. I think it's tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Uh, tomorrow at 2 o'clock? Yes, okay. I don't know where, but it's on the schedule. Thanks. Okay, well, if there are no additional questions, thank you very much. Um, see you.